All right, so hello everyone and welcome to today's uh, Polariton webinar. My name is Borna Zantarimi and I'm currently a postdoc uh, in Professor Well Yuan Giles group at UCSD. Uh, today's speaker is Professor uh, Oriel Van Drell from Heidelberg University. Uh, before we start, I'd like to uh, make a few announcements. Um, as you may already know, our webinar will be held every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And the registration for each webinar can be made through this link. And uh, you can also find a link in the uh, remind, uh, reminder email sent every week. And um, here is our uh, future uh, schedule of our talk. Next week, we don't have any talk. We're going to take a break. But the week after, we're going to have uh, Professor Todd Krauss from uh, University of Rochester and um, as our speaker. Um, also, uh, we have a Polariton Chemistry uh, Community Online webpage uh, on Facebook, which allows everyone to share papers and post announcements. You can just search it uh, and join on Facebook. Um, also, we have a YouTube channel where we upload our webinars um, every week after the webinar is over. And you can find our previous speakers' talks there. If you have missed a talk, you can just go there, subscribe, and watch these videos later. Uh, by this time, probably you're familiar with how this webinar works, but uh, during the talk, all attendees are muted. For those who have questions, you can raise hands, and I will interrupt the speaker at, at the appropriate time and enable your audio to ask questions. Also, you can type your comments into the chat panel, and you can use the Q&A to ask your questions, which really will be addressed at the end of the talk. All right, so let's move on to our uh, today's uh, talk. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Oriel Vandrell from Heidelberg University as today's speaker. Uh, Professor Vandrell obtained his PhD in theoretical and computational chemistry from Autonomous University of Barcelona. Then he spent his postdoc at Heidelberg University, where he was a uh, Humboldt and uh, Marie Curie postdoc fellow. Then in 2010, he became a senior scientist and a group leader at Center for Free Electron Laser Science and DESI in Hamburg. Um, uh, in 2016, he joined uh, Aarhus University in Denmark as an associate professor of physics. And uh, since 2018, he's the chair of theoretical chemistry at Heidelberg University. His main research interests include um, ultra-fast molecular science, molecule light interaction, non-adiabatic phenomena, time-resolved spectroscopy, dynamics of uh, highly excited molecules, and uh, cluster. And uh, today he will be talking about energy transfer and relaxation pathways involving molecular polaritons from electronic to vibrational. Uh, professor, uh, please, now you can share your screen. Let me just stop share. Right, so let me see if I can share my screen. Here, share. All right, so, so thank you very much, uh, Borna, for the kind introduction. And I would like to thank um, the Yuanso and Xiong groups for organizing this wonderful series of, of seminars that I've been following sometimes uh, live, sometimes in, in YouTube. And uh, let me move on then. So the first um, slide that I would like to show is one of the most important ones, the acknowledgements to the people that have done the actual work. So um, the work has been done with Dr. Inga Ulusoy, who moved on recently to another position. Uh, and then with a very talented PhD student, Johanna Gomez, and a very talented master's student, Niklas Krupp. So let's um, just define very um, generally what we mean by polaritonic chemistry. I think this is not really necessary in, in this audience, but anyways. So actually where we are studying the chemistry of molecules and molecular ensembles coupled to confined electromagnetic modes, and we are interested in modifying the reaction rates, the structure, spectroscopy of single molecules versus collective effects. So this is kind of a very general kind of statement. Um, if we look a little bit in, um, so I did like a search in, in Web of Science, just entering chemistry and polariton. And then you see here the, the very um, kind of uh, yeah, interesting exponential growth in papers in, in this area. And you can compare it, for example, with a search uh, under mode selective chemistry. I mean, there could be maybe other terms that one could use instead of mode selective chemistry, like laser, um, laser uh, activated chemistry or something like this. But anyways, this is not really the point. 
point is that um, I think the goals of, of polaritonic chemistry and mode selective chemistry are somehow um, related, right? So in, in mode selective chemistry, what we are after is we try to use a laser to excite some um, bond of a molecule and then to induce some, um, some chemical process in a selective way that, that departs from what the molecule would do in normal thermal conditions. And so I, I remember when I was a senior undergrad, I, I visited a, a special course on, um, on reaction dynamics uh, with the teacher that then uh, later I joined for my PhD. And I was really fascinated because he was telling us about the possibility of using lasers to, um, to induce chemical reactions uh, selectively. And if, if we look at these plots here, I mean, there are really very nice papers that have demonstrated mode selective chemistry in different situations, but somehow I think the general, the general field failed to deliver somehow because um, you are facing a big problem. If you are putting energy in a specific bond, then you have to fight against the vibrational energy of the distribution. The, the, the energy will just flow away and, and, and the system will thermalize. And if you, if you really try to go harder and you try to put more energy in that specific bond, sooner or later, then you will simply heat up the system and break it. Whereas in the case of, of having molecules in cavities, actually we are generating a, a new kind of system um, and the level of excitation of the cavity doesn't need to be high. It's just that the coupling at, at just uh, even, even no excitation or, or just one excitation, the coupling with the system is large. But, um, but we are not having many, many quanta in the system. So it's a fundamental difference. And I think polaritonic chemistry may have a bit of a chance to succeed where maybe uh, direct laser strategies failed in the, in the past. So this is for me, one of the, the largest motivations to, to come into this field. Um, and cavities have already, um, um, in a sense, uh, shown that, that uh, they can be really useful. They, they can modify chemical reactions. So some examples um, already 10 years old of uh, modification of, uh, of chemical process um, in, uh, in excited electronic states. Um, we have more recent work. I mean, there is some even before this date, but, but this is maybe the paper that really now everyone is trying to understand and, and, and subsequent papers to this one. So, so basically modifying chemical reactivity in the ground state. Uh, we have examples where cavities have mediated energy transfer between molecules that are not in close contact and, and, and. Uh, so there are, there are really many examples and, and one cannot really give here an exhaustive um, coverage of, of all of them. So, um, we do theory, so uh, I'll just define um, um, quickly and shortly what is the Hamiltonian that we use in our simulation. So in a sense, what we want to, to do is we want to simulate chemical processes with the cavities. So we start with the Hamiltonian of um, either one molecule or an ensemble of molecules that we can write as a sum of the uh, kinetic energy of the nuclei and the rest. This is the usual way that we, that we separate the Hamiltonian when, when then going to describe, for example, non adiabatic effects in molecules. Um, and then on top of this, one can add the cavity Hamiltonian, which here is written just in, in, the, in the length form um, and in the, in the dipole approximation. And uh, well, this is kind of the standard Hamiltonian that, that is used in, in many other works in, in this community. And then you see here, so how um, the, the coupling term here Lambda, right? I mean, we can we can define it in terms of these G's, and uh, in this way, one can also connect to different um, different authors have used different conventions, but in the end, uh, everything is kind of the same, right? So um, this Hamiltonian contains the first order coupling term and also a second order coupling term that comes from this uh, square over here. In our simulations, we uh, always or almost always keep the second order term. There are some recent papers. Um, that have shown that, that keeping this second order term is very important for numerical reasons um, and also fundamental reasons, like the system really has a ground state. Um, so, but we keep it. I mean, in our simulations with, uh, with our tools, it doesn't really make any computational difference to leave it out or keep it in. So we just have it. And um, just a an, an side remark, if one, um, if one just selects out the electronic part of the of the molecular Hamiltonian, 
and from the cavity we leave out the second order term, then we get something that we can call the molecular Tabiscumix Hamiltonian, which can be used directly for simulations, of course, but which we often use just for, for analytical considerations, just to get an idea of, of what is going on. Um, we usually then work uh, with this um, in an analytical way. Um, and when necessary, then we also couple a laser to the system um, as some examples that we will see later on. Maybe a short remark on collective effects. So one of the one of the important aspects that we try to understand from the theory side is actually um, what is related. So what are single molecule effects and what are collective effects? And this is really this has filled um, entire papers in this in this community, right? Um, so here we we take a pretty in a sense a simple approach to this. We will be simulating situations where the molecules in the cavity do not interact with each other. And in this case, uh, what we often do is we take the total coupling that we are interested in simulating. This is, a, this is basically what gives us the, uh, or this corresponds to the, to the Rabi splitting of the cavity. This one can see actually as an experimental parameter that, that will depend on what situation we are trying to simulate. And then um, we simply scale it with a number of molecules to get the corresponding uh, molecular coupling that reproduces this, this, uh, this effective uh, Rabi effect, right? Um, if one adds molecules without scaling the coupling, it's, uh, well, it's like, uh, like um, uh, increasing the number density of the system. If one uh, scales the coupling by square root of N, it's uh, actually like increasing the volume of the system, yeah? but anyways, the, the point is that from a theory point of view, this can allow you to discern what are actually what one can, what could um, call trivial collective effects. It would be the ones in which you simply keep adding molecules and don't um, and don't scale the coupling. And those collective effects that survive when um, when you scale the coupling down by the square root of the number of molecules. In our experience, when we simulate systems where the molecules are independent of each other and we are simply looking at some property or some effect and uh, and we we look at this effect as a function of the number of molecules we see actually that um, that uh, these prop properties usually converge in the order of 10 to 12 molecules actually so if you are interested in simulating a system that has um, hundreds of thousands of coupled molecules but you know what is the Rabi cycling and then under the assumption, for example, of, of high dilution, right? So that the, the systems do not interact with each other. You can simply simulate, so you can keep adding molecules one after the other until you reach convergence. And this is usually our approach. Um, all right, so um, our quantum dynamics toolbox is based uh, mostly on the MCTDH method. I don't want to spend time here. We have used it for many different kinds of applications. And MCTDH and especially its multi-layer extension, one can see these methods as a, as a tensor network for the wave function. And especially the multi-layer MCTDH is really very well suited to simulate molecules in cavities because then one can use the, uh, the essentially the tree structure of the wave function to separate the photonic modes from the molecules. And then the molecules can also be each molecule in its subtree. And, and this gives a very efficient wave function to simulate um, relatively large systems. And here, for example, we see the tree that corresponds to the 24 dimensional model of pyrazine. So actually this tree could be, for example, one of these sub trees that we have over here, right? Although we didn't really simulate 24 day in cavities, we used a smaller dimensional model. But this is basically our, our toolbox. All right, so let's move to, to, the, to the basics. So if we, so we start essentially with photochemistry. So if we want to modify photochemistry in cavities, the, the easiest thing to do, and maybe the most direct, is to say, well, let's couple the cavity at the Frank Condon point with uh, an excited state. And by doing this, essentially what we do effectively is uh, we lift the ground state to, the, to, to cross the excited state by the energy of the cavity photon, right? So now we have a new, uh, a new in a sense, uh, degeneracy resonance over here. And um, this is our... Um, Hamiltonian with uh, effective couplings gamma. If we now diagonalize this uh, as a function of the nuclear positions, then we will obtain a potential energy surface for the upper polariton and a potential energy surface for the lower polariton. 
And interesting is that the upper polariton is always bound. Yeah? So, so when you leave from the front condom region, you will always have some potential energy surface that goes up. And this will make the upper polariton bound. Essentially, if the ground state is bound, the upper polariton will be bound as well. And in the lower polariton, you will have always a scape channel from the front condon region, because uh, in any molecule, you will have fully symmetric coordinates. And in one of the directions of motion of the fully symmetric coordinate, the energy is going to go down. Right? So, so then you will be able to escape from, uh, from the uh, front condon region through the lower polariton. But in principle, not through the upper polariton. You need to really decay down such that the molecule can, can escape if excited into the upper polariton. Um, if you have several molecules, things get a bit more complicated. Then you have dark states. I mean, you know that um, in dark stage, if you have a set of atoms and the cavity, and then um, you have a, a resonance between the, so the, the atoms and the cavity are at resonance, and you will get a set of dark states exactly at the energy of the, uh, of the uh, cavity or the, the atomic excitations. And that's it. But if uh, you can change the resonance condition by changing the distance between the molecules, then you'll get here a soup of different kinds of crossings. And uh, you can see, for example, that there is, so this is the scan of one of the interatomic distances in a diatomic system. And you see here a crossing and here there's another crossing. And these crossings occur when um, three molecules are at the same distance. So for example, at this point, we are fixing these two distances, this one, these two distances, and then we have these crossings. Um, this is something that one can understand from the point of view of arrowhead matrices. So the, the molecular tab is Cummings Hamiltonian in, in it's actually a arrowhead matrix, meaning that, uh, well, so all these um, regions here are zeros and then, um, for an arrowhead matrix, when you have three entries in the diagonal that are the same, then this generates a, um, a point of degeneracy. This point of degeneracy is of order two, if you have just three molecules at the same position, because there are two coordinates that you can change and you go out of the, um, of the degeneracy point. If you have four molecules with the same geometry, then you have a uh, crossing point of order three, because there are three coordinates that you can change and then you get out of the crossing point. So these are basically the collective conical intersections between, um, between the dark states. Um, one can analyze this. So one can start from this tavis um Hamiltonian and make a linear expansion of the molecular potentials at the Frank Condon point. Then alpha is just the energy at the Frank Condon point, and beta is the slope difference between the ground state and the excited state. So this is this is beta here. And then um, I'm just gonna be quick about this. It's not really that I want to go into all the details. Then one can introduce uh, symmetry adapted polaritonic states um, and dark states. One introduces the symmetry adapted coordinates. So for example, this row means that all distances change by the same amount. And then we have these, these two degenerate, uh, in a sense, vibrational modes. And then we can calculate the couplings of the um, of, so of this Hamiltonian with respect to changing um, one of these coordinates. And if we do this, we end up, let me just go to the end of this slide. So we end up with a Hamiltonian that is actually a Jantella Hamiltonian. So we have the zeroth order term in which the, so this is at the Frank Condon point and this is the atomic in a sense Hamiltonian. Then we have um, the polariton polariton coupling and you see that every, so always the coupling is proportional to beta. Here the coordinates that are moving are the symmetric coordinates. Then we have the coupling of the polariton with the dark states, also with a coupling constant beta, and then the dark state dark state coupling, where two dark with two, uh, where the two um, um, e in a sense e modes are moving, also proportional to beta that couples the dark states. So actually, with three molecules, we get an e cross e um, Yantella situation, and then if we have three molecules, then we get the t cross t, and so on. So this is just uh, how we can connect um, um, the, the dark state crossings with, with the crossings that we know from, from, mole, from molecules with certain symmetries. Uh, sorry, um, I, guess, I guess we have a question from the audience. Yeah, sure, of course. 
Oh, hi, Oriol. Uh, can, can you comment a little bit about the scalings of these uh, dark, dark state, dark state couplings uh, as a function of number of molecules? Um, okay, so what you see here, this is square root of six. This is actually related to the, to the three molecules. Um, but if you let me come to about two thirds of the talk. Okay, okay, sure. Uh, we will see this in actually in, in the case of, of vibrations and then we'll see how the scaling uh, works with, with the number of molecules and the dark states. And here is not so easy to see and then I would have to spend time that I can- oh, sure, thank you. Is that you. fine? Yeah. All right. Yeah, of course. Uh, so, okay. So now we can ask the question, okay, so does this matter? So let's just have a look at, uh, at a specific uh, numerical simulation, a very simple one. So we are just looking at the dissociation of sodium iodide. So um, if we have no cavity, we place the, um, the uh, wave packet from the ground state, we move it to the excited state, like it would happen if the system has absorbed the photon, and then we let it go. Then you see the wave packet just moves in the upper state and dissociates. Um, if we now um, um, if we now look at the dynamics in the lower polariton for one molecule, it does it, it does essentially the same. Yeah? The, the system is moving out of this potential surface. Um, if we look at the lower polariton now with um, five molecules again, so we start directly down here. So it's just all downhill. So um, nothing happens. Now, if the simulation starts in the upper polariton with one molecule. You see this, the molecules are more or less trapped here. They are oscillating. And then we see um, density coming out um, basically at, at every oscillation of the system. Now we look at the dynamics starting from the upper polariton and when there are several molecules. The only thing that we have done is to add molecules here. Now you see that the dynamics looks substantially different. Now it's essentially as um, you are seeing a sort of, of continuous um, transfer to the lower polariton and then dissociation. Yeah? It's more like, uh, like a continuous um, decay of the system through this area of dark state. So actually they, they do influence this, um, the, the dynamics, the fact that we have several molecules and it's not like going directly from here to here and having a similar dynamic as we would have in this case. Um, we looked actually into, um, into more complex systems like pyrazine. So this, this appeared already some time ago. So uh, what we did is we coupled uh, a cavity with the, uh, with, uh, the S2 state. So in pyrazine, basically, is a, uh, so if the molecule absorbs into the S2 state, which is bright, then there is a, a conical intersection with S1. And um, the, the, the question that we were asking is, well, so how is the cavity going to change the dynamics of the system going through the natural conical intersection compared with, uh, with uh, well, with the fact that also when having more than one molecule, we will even have then conical intersections between dark states and, and so on. And so this is basically the question that we were asking when we, um, when we did this work. Now, um, yeah, we, we did different uh, levels of coupling. Um, if the coupling is very large, you can even have a situation where you are pushing the lower polariton below the natural conical intersection. This, I will not show the simulations on this, uh, but in this case, actually it's pretty boring because the system gets stuck there. Uh, I will show a situation with a smaller coupling um, where then the system can escape. Now, we see the same principle as before. We start in the upper polariton as the initial state, and then we are monitoring the amount of population that ends up in S1. So the amount of, of uh, let's say, of population that can escape from S2 and from the polaritonic system, which is now coupled via the cavity and finish in S1. If we have just one molecule at the coupling strength that we are considering, well, the system gets stuck in the upper polariton, but as we start to add more and more molecules, then we see that the system can escape from the upper polariton. So there are, there are newer channels for the system to, to come down. Then the system will make it into, the, into S2 and then finally to S1. But we see here in this plot is the expectation value of the interaction term um, between, so if the interaction term between the molecules and the cavity, this is the dipolar, the dipole of the molecules, and this is the, the, the displacement of the cavity. And uh, if this is um, one, this means that the system is found in the upper polariton. If it's minus one, we are in the lower polariton. And when we are around zero, 
um, we are in either dark states or the system has completely escaped the, the, the polaritonic subsystem. And, uh, and you can also see how as one adds a couple of more molecules, then there is a very fast decay from the upper polariton down into some mishmash that is more or less like dark states. Um, and maybe the system already leaving completely the polaritonic uh, states and going into, into S1. No? So this would also be here. Um, we also um, looked in, in a different contribution to the competition between uh, the dynamics of the molecule and the decay of the, of, of the cavity. So basically lossy cavities. This one can do uh, in an approximate way by uh, extending the energy of the system with a complex energy, which then um, uh, basically will, will have the uh, excited cavity decay with a certain uh, lifetime. So we set this uh, to be, I mean, we tried different values, but the one, the simulation that I'm showing correspond to a lifetime of about 45 femtoseconds. And in this case, at the coupling strength of the cavity, you see that the spectrum of the absorption spectrum of pyrazine uh, splits into two, um, into two regions. The lower polariton region with its structure, which comes from the natural, in a sense, um, and different uh, states of pyrazine, essentially like we take the absorption spectrum and we split it in two separate spectra, upper and lower polariton. And this is the upper polariton. Then we tune a laser to selectively, so this is the, this is the envelope of the corresponding laser, so to envelope, so to, to be resonant either with the lower polariton or with the upper polariton. Yeah? So, and you can see here how, if your laser is resonant with the upper polariton, um, and there is only one molecule in the system, well, the, the system gets stuck in the upper polariton and then um, the cavity loss uh, will, will actually win. This means that the, the cavity will re-emit the photon and, and then that's it. Yeah? The excitation will be gone via the cavity. So you see here that in this case, the probability of emitting the photon is about 75%. But as one adds molecules to the system, then the one is opening effective decay channels from the upper polariton to the lower polariton. So, um, and actually into dark states and, and allowing the system as we saw in the previous slide to actually then go into S1. And then we see that the probability of emission then goes down uh, very substantially. Yeah? And this may be important because lossy cavities are, uh, for example, so um, nanoplasmonic cavities. And in that case, um, the, the number of molecules really matters. I mean, these are, these are really nanostructures and, and we are not talking about a fabric perot geometry where we have thousands or tens of thousands of molecules coupled at the same time, but we are talking about a finite number. So actually um, having one or having five um, close to, to, to the deep of a, of a plasmonic structure may really make a difference. Right? So that's what, what we see over here. If we go to the lower polariton, there's almost no difference. The system can escape fast enough and there is, um, there is a smaller emission from the cavity. Uh, we looked at different things in this work. Um, um, we also um, simulated the situation where the cavity is now resonant between S2 and S1. So in a sense, it opens a new decay channel from the photo excited state onto the, the state that is also accessed via the, um, the, the conical um, uh, intersection of the system. And here, the, the take home message is that, well, I mean, as you can see all these curves and there are lots of curves here, but they all correspond to different numbers of molecules. And you can see that they are all essentially the same. If the cavity is resonant at the S1 minimum, then the systems can, so the system can accumulate down here. And then we see a larger probability of emission. And if the cavity is resonant, for example, with the S2 minimum, yeah, I mean, there's very little amount of uh, probability that the system will go to this region and very little amount of uh, photon emission. Essentially, the system then will end up doing its normal dynamics, which is decaying to S1 and then oscillating a little bit. So the, the important thing here, however, is that there are absolutely no collective effects in the one photon regime because the system has been excited from here to here just with one photon, even if the excitation is, um, is coherent. So all molecules um, have been excited with the same phase. In the end, we are working in the one photon regime. This we make very sure of by using a low intensity, um, a low intensity laser. And in that case, um, in a sense, there is only one molecule and this single molecule is the one that will see 
the conical inter sorry will see the, the the geometry at which the, the system is resonant with the cavity and there are absolutely no um, collective effects possible this is something that was also reported in a paper that appeared almost at the same time as ours from the mukamel group and actually they they saw exactly the same uh, the same situation um, if we now go to a situation where the cavity is coupled um, so we are coupling s1 so the state reached after the non-adiabatic decay and the ground state, then we see that there are small differences actually between different numbers of, uh, of molecules. The dynamics is still very similar in all cases, but there are still um, small differences. And this is because actually at the geometry at which the cavity is resonant between S0 and S1, there is a small um, density of uh, S0 at that geometry. And this is the only reason why in this case, um, there is a little bit of, of effects that depend on the, on the number of molecules, but they stagnate very quickly with the number of molecules. Yeah? So, but as I said, this is something that depends only on the fact that at these geometries, and here we're studying difference of Franconden point, the conical intersection and S1, that at that point, there is a little bit of probability that the ground state system is also found at that geometries. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's move on at this point. So in the, in the second part, I would like to switch gears and go to vibrational strong coupling, which is of course a very uh, actual topic. Um, here I'm showing an illustration actually by the, by the host groups, uh, uh, Yuan Chuo and, and Xiong. Um, and here the question is, well, I mean, we see very fast relaxations uh, and energy transfer between polaritons. This has been probed using uh, 2D spectroscopies. And we are trying to understand what's going on in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the vibrational, um, so between the vibrational polaritons. So in order to, so before going into that, let me just give you a very short account of, uh, of Fermi resonances. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, that you're all familiar with uh, what a Fermi resonance is. Maybe just um, a very, a very short uh, reminder. So um, this, is, this is a system that we know very well. We have studied it over the years uh, with full quantum dynamics. And uh, if you look at the, at the proton transfer mode, um, it has its fundamental at about 1000 wave numbers. Now, um, there are other modes, so um, the pyramidalization modes of the water molecules in the, in the Zundel cation, and uh, especially the oxygen-oxygen distance, so the, the distance between the two water molecules, that can deliver an overtone that happens to be very close to the fundamental of the proton, and these two, um, these two oscillations then, in a sense, so, so this second mode gathers intensity from the, from the proton motion, which is the one that in this case carries the, the largest uh, um, uh, change in dipole. And then you end up with a doublet in the, um, in the absorption spectrum. This is basically the infrared absorption spectrum um, of the system. So um, a simple way very quickly to, to, uh, to rationalize what's going on is you can take your vibrational Hamiltonian, you split it into a zeroth order term that, uh, for example, a harmonic approximation and the coupling terms. And then you define the eigenstates of the zeroth order Hamiltonian. And the condition for a Fermi resonance is that you have two states of H0 that belong to the same symmetry. Otherwise, they will not see each other. Um, that um, such that the coupling term is not uh, zero, yeah? and also that their energies are close to one another. Yeah, and this is basically then the definition of a Fermi resonance in a nutshell. So we are going to try to understand the coupling between polaritonic states from the perspective of Fermi resonances. So we start with a very simple model. Our molecules are made of a coordinate that we call small q which in this case we are writing in second quantization just for convenience and a molecule that we call large Q and this we will just write um, in, in momentum and position operators and this is a low frequency coordinate. Yeah. So um, then we have coupling terms. So you see here a coupling constant and then um, the displacement of the small Q coordinate and the displacement of the large coordinate to some powers R and S. Then we have the uncoupled cavity mode and the coupling between 
the cavity and the small Q coordinate. So let's say the, the coordinate that is at the, at the highest uh, frequency. Yeah? So we could think here, uh, I mean, this uh, small Q coordinate could be a CO uh, bond in, in some, in some uh, organic system or something like this. Yeah? So we just, um, now, um, the total Hamiltonian then can be written um, yeah, according to these terms. And we are just singling out now for, for the matter of discussion, the coupling term of order three that has that is a quadratic on the small coordinate Q, which is the one that we are coupling to the cavity and it's linear in the big coordinate Q. Um, we are not looking at the one one because in a sense, we assume that we start from normal modes and the one one has already been rotated away from whatever initial coordinates we had. Now, the, the uh, coupling term, we are rewriting it. I mean, this would be this displacement squared by simply removing the non-energy conserving terms and, and using the commutator between these two guys. And we can write it in this form that is easier for, um, for figuring out what are the matrix elements. And that's the system that we are simulating, a bunch of these molecules and the cavity. All right, so we are going to diagonalize first the cavity interacting with the high frequency coordinate with a small q. And the basis that we have is basically a number of photons in the cavity, which molecule is excited in the small q and which molecule is excited in the big q coordinate. Yeah, so we are just considering that one molecule is excited at a time. This is not really a fundamental limitation, but just so that we can write it in a more or less compact way. Now. If we do this, if we first diagonalize the cavity uh, molecule, um, so small q problem, what we get is just dark states, uh, sorry, um, polaritonic states that now carry an index k. So what molecule has an excitation in its um, high frequency, uh, sorry, in its low frequency mode in the big Q, but these are just the, the polaritonic states that we know very well. And then we have the corresponding dark states. Um, now the question is, um, are there couplings that involve the, uh, the third order um, lambda two one term? Yeah? So two couplings in the, in, uh, so, so uh, second order in small q and, and first order in, in big q. The same we could ask for, for the two two term. I mean, as I said, I mean, there is really no difference in the end. Um, now, what, what we are, I mean, what, what we can realize here is that the polaritons have, um, have contribution from KETs that have an excitation in M. So one, one molecule M has um, its, its small Q coordinate excited. You know? And these KETs will remain unaltered by action of these here. This is lowering it and then it's raising it again. Um, so, so these um, terms will survive on both sides. And then we have the linear term in big Q that will connect this K with this K. So actually it's clear that there is, that there is a coupling. And uh, if we evaluate these couplings, then we get, uh, we get these expressions here. So um, the coupling term in this case, um, coupling directly the polaritons is inversely proportional to the number of molecules and coupling the polariton with the dark states is inversely proportional to the square root of the number of molecules. We can go on and we can say, well, let's just insert this coupling matrix element just for the sake of seeing their, their complete scaling into, a, uh, into an expression for the Fermi's golden wool. Just, I mean, here we're not making any complications in terms of densities of states or anything like this, simply as we just want to see what is the total scaling if we would see these couplings as participating in a rate process. No? So in this energy scale, we have now the, the um, the lower polariton, the upper polariton. And uh, if we then consider those states at, in which the, um, so in which there is an excitation in the coordinate um, large Q and the, um, this uh, low frequency mode is resonant with the polaritonic gap, then all these um, uh, lower polariton states with an excitation in the corresponding uh, low frequency mode are resonant here with the upper polariton. Now, the corresponding coupling constant is uh, this one over here. So this is the coupling between, between this initial state and these final states. And now we can sum over all possible final states, which is what we do here. And then we end up with a rate constant that is inversely proportional 
to the number of molecules M. So actually this channel is, if we have many molecules, it will become less and less um, important. Now we can do the same exercise, but assuming that the low frequency mode is resonant with half the energy of the polaritonic subsystem, meaning that it is resonant with the energy difference between one of the polaritons and the, uh, and the dark states. In that case, the uh, coupling between each of, so the initial state and each of the possible dark states is given by this expression over here. Now, if we take the summation over K, these coefficient squares will deliver a one. And then if we take the summation over the M minus one dark states in each one of these blocks, we'll get M minus one. So we will get a rate which goes with M minus one divided by M, which essentially will tend to one, so this, this part over here, um, pretty quickly, right? I mean, after 10 to 12 molecules, then uh, the rate um, of uh, transfer from the upper polariton to the dark states um, via this resonant, uh, this resonance will uh, become independent of the, um, of the number of molecules. So this is a channel that will remain robust and that uh, will enable the transfer of energy from, for example, the upper polariton in this case onto, uh, onto dark states using an, an harmonic coupling, for example, to a low frequency mode that could be a bath mode or something like this. Now, just to make a quick connection to, um, to what we have seen before, if we take the Hamiltonian that we are now uh, considering, uh, so this vibrational Hamiltonian, and we write it as a function of the low frequency coordinates. So then we just single out uh, like this, and we write it as a matrix using the basis of, uh, of, um, of cats in which we have either one or zero excitations in the cavity and molecule M is excited. We will end up actually again with a narrow head matrix and we will end up again with exactly the same kind of situation. I mean, it's just we're using now a different, a different basis and a different way of looking at it, but we will get exactly the same situation that we had seen before with the electronic states. And of course, it, it should not come as a surprise that in the end, everything is the same. And whether we do it vibrationally or electronically, we can formulate it in the same terms. And this may not be the best representation really to discuss. I mean, here you also have conical intersections as a function of the coordinates big Q, but this is maybe not the most, uh, uh, let's say, useful way to think about these vibrational problems. But anyway, just to say that everything in the end turns out to be the same. Now, we looked at the spectrum of these models. So for example, with two and five molecules, you see here the polaritonic gap. And then you see that the upper polariton opens into, uh, into two new states. And this is basically due to, the, due to the Fermi resonance that involves the low frequency mode. If we have now the upper uh, sorry, we have now the low frequency mode being resonant with half the polaritonic gap. Then we also have a, an upper polariton that has a, a few peaks, right? Because now it, basically all this um, uh, the Fermi resonance, and this is a bit more complicated. I mean, it has uh, more structure than, than in the other case because there are more states and things become just more complicated. Yeah? And as I said, uh, this, I mean, we are not really simulating the Hamiltonian that I showed. We simulate the Hamiltonian with second order coupling. Yeah? So what we, I showed a uh, second before, um, was to illustrate, um, I mean, just, just to, to do some analytical considerations of, of what's going on. Right, so now just to see that this is actually a, a mechanism for energy transfer, what we are looking at here is that the probability that the low frequency mode gets one quanta um, as a function of the detuning of the cavity. So here we are detuning the cavity from the small Q coordinates, so from the high frequency, um, from the high frequency mode and then um, plotting how much energy or, or what is the level of excitation of the, uh, of the low frequency mode after a certain amount of time. Yeah? So this, this, I mean, we just look for the maximum. So, um, and you can see that at, um, so when, when the cavity is resonant with small Q, then we have the most effective energy transfer. Then we have this structure over here that appears with, with five molecules and we don't really understand it yet fully. Um, we've been speculating different things, but, but we don't know exactly what it is, but it, it illustrates the fact that when we add molecules, things become more complicated. And as I said, we don't simulate the simple situation that I showed in the analytical considerations, but we simulate the full thing, right? So, and here, for example, we have another, um, so another resonance that appears when the cavity 
detunes by by one quanta of of uh, of, uh, of the low frequency mode, and this is when the cavity hits overtones of the high frequency and the low frequency mode. Yeah? But uh, again, this this only appears for mole for more than one molecule. If we detune the low frequency mode, then uh, that's that's very clean. So as the low frequency mode detunes from the polaritonic gap, we see that at some point it stops it stops coupling, it stops gaining energy at all. Right. So what we have seen is that the intramolecular anharmonic coupling is the one that is driving the energy transfer from the upper to the lower polariton, um, being in a sense assisted by, uh, by a low frequency mode that can take this energy. And, and, and the anharmonicity is intramolecular, of course. Now, um, we have started looking at uh, the uh, cis trans isomerization in HO and O as well. This is a, a system that is also um, very well known. It's a six dimensional problem for which we have a fully coupled and harmonic potential energy surface, including the full torsion. So this is all done in internal coordinates. And we're interested in simulating the isomerization from the cis to the trans side, inside and outside the cavity. Now here you see the fundamentals um, of the different modes. Now, so the OH, the double NO bond and so on. Right? So um, here I want to illustrate first of all a uh, different kind of Fermi resonance that also involves the cavity. So to discuss it, I'm going to use this um, this uh, cat here, where this first number is the number of photons in the cavity, and then we have the quanta in the in the double bond NO over here. This is the number of quanta in the torsion. And this here is the number of quanta in the bond, uh, sorry, in the, in the, in the bond angle um, O and O over here. Yeah. Now, the cavity, um, we make it resonant with the fundamental of the double NO bond. So actually this then generates two polaritons. We are making the coupling pretty strong indeed. So, um, I mean, in, in, uh, in vibrational strong coupling, the couplings uh, don't become so strong, but okay, this is, we are trying to understand here um, different situations. So um, now the cavity, as I said, it couples the, the double bond NO. Um, and then, <clears throat> for example, in this system, um, there is an overtone that involves two quanta of the torsion and one quanta of this, uh, of this bond angle over here. So this is then written as uh, this, this case, yeah? so the, the zero to one in the molecule without cavity. And this, um, this um, uh, overtone, then if, if one keeps increasing the, the cavity molecule coupling at some point, it will become resonant with the upper polariton. And then we'll have an effective energy transfer between the upper polariton and this particular uh, mode. You know? This, this mode is coupled because actually the, um, the fundamental of the double bond is coupled with this, um, with this overtone. Yeah? And the two here, I mean, the, the couplings involve even uh, quanta in the torsion because of symmetry reasons. So um, you can see, for example, this is basically the spectrum in the upper polariton region for different couplings, for increasing couplings until the resonance is hit. And then when the resonance is hit, then we see that the corresponding upper polariton peak splits into two. And this is basically um, the upper polariton and this overtone um, over here. Yeah? So this is now this, this other type of Fermi resonance that involves one of the polaritons directly with an overtone of the molecule. Um, and here you can see how if we start, um, if, we, if we place the uh, so a, a quantum of excitation initially in the upper polariton, the ground state of the um, of the torsion is depleting quite quickly. This is time femtoseconds, so the population in this case is going down very fast. The uh, second excited state is correspondingly increasing, and then you we, and then yeah you can see. Um, the state number four, the state number six, again, for symmetry reasons, they are also coupled that also start to gain some population. So we see that after we put the quanta in the um, upper polariton, this ground state localized on the C side starts to populate the first excited state, 
the next one and the next one and so on. Yeah? So, and then from here, of course, then tunneling may be possible. Yeah? So that's kind of the, the, the idea. Um, um, just for comparison, if we place the quanta, uh, so the quantum of excitation in the lower polariton, we see that the population remains mostly down here. So there is no resonance, therefore no, um, no depopulation of the, um, of the ground state. In, if we project it onto, onto a basis of, of torsion functions. Um, now, um, we have also looked into the, uh, into the probability that the system reaches the trans um, site in the cavity. So um, you can see here we are, what we are doing is we are plotting the probability of the trans site as a function of the coupling strength. This is basically G over omega. So if we go to pretty strong, couplings for the vibrational case. Um, but as I said, I mean, this is, uh, um, these are model, this is a model study. And um, the idea here is that when we hit 1.1, then we have a quite large, I mean, in comparison to other coupling strengths, probability that the system makes it to the trans um, side. I'm, I'm just a couple of slides from the, from the end. And... We actually have a question, if you. Ah, okay, sorry, I thought you were already oh. starting. Matt. Yeah. Okay. So, Matt, go ahead. Yes. Uh, uh, I have a question about the ladder climbing effect that you showed in the previous slide regarding yes. like Can going go from upper polariton to higher yeah. uh, torsional states. Yes. So is this? So you mentioned that this ladder climbing effect is related to some symmetry reasons. So is that like the counter rotating terms like the, the no, 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 the, coupling that medium no no no. no 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 this has to do with the fact that the molecule uh, so the uh, so at the cis um, geometry the molecule is planar and then the torsion mode is symmetrical so it's the same if you go to larger or to smaller angles from zero the cis geometry is the one at zero angle and therefore the coupling terms um, of the of the torsion with other modes, so for example, modes that are in so in plane motions, like the like the angle or like the bond stretchings, it happens. So it it generates coupling terms in the torsion that are symmetric, that are even functions, and these even functions it's excite so produce even excitations of the wave function when 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 you consider this coupling. So it's a pure uh, it, it's a symmetry of the of the molecular system that um, that couples the even states with even states. Uh, are you assuming that you, you're pumping with enough photons such that you can no, I mean, efficiently uh, get no, like, the, those the, uphill transitions? Or? The initial state is one excitation in uh, one of the polaritonic states, in this case, the upper polariton. But um, what we are, I mean, what I'm showing here is the population of just the basis. This is, a, this is um, so we define a, a one-dimensional operator for the torsion, diagonalize it and get the basis. And then project the total wave function onto this basis. So actually, um, from this perspective, the fact that higher excitations also get population is not really um, related to the fact that this would be non-resonant. It's related to the fact that actually the true states of the system um, have components of these different bases, like a little bit in a sense, right? So. Um, the the uh, still the, the main transition happens to the new equals to two, which must be very so. Let's say there, there must be an actual eigenstate of the vibrational system, where uh, if you look into the into the torsional direction, uh, it's it's in a sense very similar to mu two, right? I mean, um, but but this is just this is just a one dimensional basis onto which we are projecting the total wave function and calculating probability um, densities, or let's say, yeah, one dimensional I probabilities. Yeah. I see, okay. Actually, I have a, one more question. Uh, yes. So at the beginning of the talk, I think you mentioned that you include, you keep the uh, dipole self-energy term. Yes. In your simulation. So I'm just curious, uh, so in this, these results, and then the, as well as the previous results, does that term play a significant role in the results you see? I mean, to be honest, we have not simulated without this term. Um, yeah. And um, I mean, we, we could try that, but at the strong couplings that we have, I suspect that, the, that, that we will completely break the system. If we would be having very, very weak 
total couplings that might still then then it will not be important of course it's like what we have in the in the electronic case but um, we could try but um, i'm not even sure I, I have the impression that the wave packet will just uh, hit the walls because it will not be really contained in the in the simulation volume in a sense but um, we have not really tried we always kept it in the simulations oh, okay cool. thank you yeah welcome we have actually a question all right Go ahead. Uh, I think she's just speaking. She's speaking. I'm not sure if you can. She's just, she's just, I think, I think. just mute. Okay. No, yeah. Something I, doesn't work with the microphone. Yeah, I don't know. If it doesn't work, she's sitting two rooms in the in that direction, so I can talk to her after the talk. <laughs> she's visiting us in Heidelberg. <laughs> so, I, I can just let, let. maybe maybe it will work now. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. She uh, but she's still, uh, but I, I asked her to unmute, but I don't know. Uh, I don't know, anyway. Uh, I just continue till the end. Uh, it's it's close to the end anyway. Yeah. Okay. All right. So yes, so we were um, here, right? So, so um, we also look at the, um, at the isomerization. So again, we start with uh, uh, either upper polariton or lower polariton excited, and then we scan over the total coupling here. And then at some point, at 1.1, then we have an enhanced um, probability of going to the trans side here as a function of time. I mean, you see it's more or less uh, uh, increasing monotonically. Um, for the simulation time, and then it goes down again at 1.3, right? So, at, so somehow we thought that this may be actually due to, to some specific resonance, but we have not really solved the issue. I, I just show it to you because I think it's interesting. So if we look at two molecules now, so let's stay up here first. So again, um, we have now two molecules coupled to the, to the cavity, and then we scan the total coupling. So this is given over here. And then we see that at coupling 1.1, we start to have uh, a larger, let's say, transition towards trans. These are these green curves here. And then at 1.3, then um, the, 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 the transition towards the trans side is, in a sense, faster. And even um, here, the, the upper polariton is down here and the lower polariton is up here. So, so this is not directly related to the energy transfer mechanism that I showed you before, but it has to be some sort of resonance and we're still nailing it down. But um, I think the, the almost the most interesting thing is the following. So when we have two molecules and we have a total coupling of 1.1, this is example over here, the coupling per molecule is 1.1 divided by our square root of seven, uh, square root of two, so which gives us roughly 0 0.7. So now you can compare the probability of going to the trans side when you have one molecule at a coupling of 0 0.7, and this is this line down here. Uh, so if we go to the previous slide, this would correspond to some line down here. Uh, so one molecule at 0 0.7. And then we take two molecules where the coupling of each molecule to the cavity is also 0 0.7, but the total coupling is 1.1. And this is this curve over here. So actually the, the effect that we are seeing is related to the, um, to the position of the polaritons, or at least to the total coupling of the molecules with the polaritonic system and not to the individual molecular coupling. But as I said, there are still a few open questions here. If someone wants to ask, we can discuss, but um, we, we have not figured it out completely yet, but I think this is quite remarkable. And that's the reason why I wanted to, to show it, even if it's quite preliminary. Um, 
just a short summary before concluding. So at the beginning, we saw that um, the short time upper polariton and lower polariton dynamics are different. That's clear. Um, if you start the dynamics in the upper polariton, you have a delay because you have to reach the lower polariton. In some cases, this delay may not be important for the outcome of the photochemical reaction. In some cases, it may. Yeah? But, uh, but the, you first have to come out of the upper polariton to be able to, to leave the Frank Condon um, region. And in lossy cavities, um, this effect um, will, so it, it will make a difference whether you start in the upper polariton or in the lower polariton because it will affect the time that the molecule is um, basically resonant uh, with the cavity. Um, we have also seen two types of, of vibrational polaritonic Fermi resonance, which are caused by molecular anharmonicity, so intramolecular anharmonicity in this case. The polaritonic, um, um, so, so resonances with the polaritonic energy gap, and this is then um, important for energy transfer to low frequency modes. This could be bath modes surrounding the molecule. Could be if you have a large molecular system, some like more um, fluffy motions of the of the of the skeleton, for example. And then you also have the possibility of Fermi resonances directly with the upper and with the lower polariton, and this mediates energy transfer within the molecules and opens new channels of energy transfer that are not available when the molecules are isolated. So this can be important um, to understand um, effects on reactivity that we still don't fully understand, as I said also at the beginning of the, of the talk, this is kind of still open, there are several open questions. And then in terms of the isomerization of HONO, um, and still, this is very preliminary, but we see that um, the probability of uh, isomerization onto the trans form, starting from the cis form, correlates at, uh, as we increase the coupling of the cavity to the double bond NO, um, the probability of transition correlates with the total coupling and not with the individual molecular coupling, as we could see in the, in the last um, slide. And with this, I've come to the end of the talk, hope more or less in time. And I'd like to thank you all for your questions and uh, attention, and I'm ready to take more questions if there are. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Professor, for the wonderful talk. Um, I actually, uh, we have a couple of questions, but I have a quick question about the last part of your talk. So yes. the isomerization that you showed is basically just rotation about the single bond, right? That's right. Uh, Right. Um, if you actually um, have this cis trans isomerization in which you are actually breaking a pi bond around a, a double bond, does it change um, the conclusion that you made? Because you, you are assuming that, okay, the, um, so if you go to the summary slide, so uh, you're saying that the um, isomerization probability correlates with the light matter coupling not the coupling strength of it, because I, I don't know, but because basically this is just a single bond rotation. Maybe if you are actually um, breaking um, a pi bond that, I mean, can this change the conclusion or? Uh, I don't know, I guess this will depend on the actual mechanism. I mean, for example, if you think in terms of, of the ethylene molecule, right? Mm -hmm. So, so when, when you rotate, you will go through basically an intersection between the ground state and the excited state. Um, but whether this is important or not, I mean, if you are really, uh, if you keep the system in the ground state and then um, you couple the cavity to some vibration, for example, the CC bond or, or the CH bonds or something that really can, uh, can couple with torsion, uh, at least uh, to some degree, right? And, and, and you can transfer energy to that torsion. At some point, you don't really need to come to the point where you are really, where, where, where you're really at 90 degrees in a sense, right? I mean, these are right. hydrogen. You can even just with, with some amount of energy, you could even tunnel to the other side. And uh, so I, I don't see really a fundamental difference um, with the fact that you're breaking a double bond. I mean, um, it, it, it might be different if you are exciting, if you are photo exciting the system, but if you start from the ground state, then whether there is an excited state up there or not, it, that will depend on the particular case. All right, thanks. Um, Okay, we have a couple of questions from the audience, uh, Professor Wei. Hey, very nice talk. Um, so I have uh, two questions about the second part of your talk. So yes. in order to see this uh, Fermi resonance, 
So do we need to see these uh, double or triple peaks in the upper parietal or some of the peaks um, could be dark or do they have to all yeah, okay. be bright? Okay, so, so uh, that's, that's a good point. So um, if, if one looks at spectroscopy, uh, so at, basically at spectra of polaritonic systems that have been published, I mean, I have never seen such uh, a Fermi resonance, uh, whereas um, we know that the upper polariton depopulates very quickly and it must be related to this kind of mechanisms. The thing is that th there is there are a lot of broadening mechanisms and I am pretty sure that these Fermi resonances are thinner than many other broadening mechanisms that are operating in, the, in, in an actual system. And we will not see them really in the spectrum. The, 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 the lines are too wide. But um, yeah, so, so actually I'm, I'm not really aware of a situation where one has seen a splitting in the upper polaridon. Maybe one would need a very clean system where one has somehow, um, yeah, I mean, probably in the gas phase, then the densities are too small to really have an effective coupling with a cavity. I, I really don't know. But, yeah. but but I'm pretty sure that that it has to do with with the, with the broadenings with the natural broadenings that we have in, in natural systems. I see. I see. Thank you. Um, the the second question is uh, for this mechanism that you propose uh, uh, for the intramolecular and harmonic coupling with the low frequency mode. So that it has to be a low frequency mode um, within the molecule, or it ha it could also be a low frequency mode, say in the solvent. Right. Yeah. Another very good question because so the so the, what I showed here. So in order to couple the upper polariton with the lower polariton, you need to be in second order with the um, with the coordinate that couples to the cavity. So you need coupling terms of the type lambda two n mm -hmm. or. In, I think in here it was s in the in the slide. So lambda two s, where s can be one, two, three, fifteen. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, that's because these are the terms that will link the upper polariton with the lower polariton or the upper polariton with the dark states. If you have, um, and you say you have an isolated molecule and you say, well, I'm, I'm starting from a normal modes picture, then the one, one term is not there. But if you have a bath, imagine that then you describe the coupling of a molecule where you have already like normal modes of the molecule. And then you introduce a bath coupling that you describe at the linear, so at the bilinear level, right? So, so QQ coupling with the bath modes. Mm -hmm. Then what will happen is that these QQ terms will take the energy of the polaritonic system and will deliver it to the bath modes. But you will not go from the upper to the lower polariton. You will go in the molecule from mm -hmm. an excited vibration that involves the small q, so the high frequency um, um, vibration and the polariton, you will remove this excitation and you will transfer it completely to the bath. So it's, it's, a, different, it's a different situation. One can also call it, I mean, um, uh, resonant or non-resonant, uh, but, um, but it will not link the two polaritons or the polaritons with the dark states. For that, you need at least second order or you need second order actually in the, in the small q, in the coordinate coupled to the cavity. So okay, I see. Thank you. Okay, well, we can go ahead. Hey, Uriel, that was a really beautiful talk. Uh, I, I wanted to ask, okay, took one comment first uh, in your th third conclusion on uh, how the isomerization uh, correlates with uh, Total light matter coupling. Um, I don't know if you agree with me on this statement, but I think there's a general trend, right? Like so, so as long as the initial state or the reactant or the doorway state is a polariton, then you can expect uh, the chemical process to actually uh, depend on collective light matter coupling. But if the if the target state is a polariton or the, the product is a polariton, then uh, that effect won't be there because uh, the rate going into polaritons uh, de decays as one over n, but then the, the decay out of the polariton doesn't. So, so I, I don't know. So I, I think, I think I, yes, I, I can agree with your statement. Yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's probably, it has to do with the fact that we are starting with a polaritonic um, excitation. Um, we have not yet, I mean, I, I can maybe 
um, just give me a short second. I'm just going here again, just, just for this. Um, I think I have it here. Yeah, so for this, I probably don't. Yeah, so this is, this is for example, um, the probability of isomerization starting from a state that is not a polariton. It's basically the cavity is in its ground state and the rest is in the ground state, but it's not really the true ground state of the molecule. It's really constructed as a product state of, uh, of, uh, of ground states of one dimensional operators. In a sense, it's an uncorrelated state that also contains some higher excitations. In a sense, it's, we were chilling a little bit here. Yeah? We would have to do it a bit differently. But in, so starting from this state, also plotting the probability of, uh, of uh, isomerization as a function of the coupling, we see it increasing. Yeah? But maybe uh, I think you have a point here. So we should probably repeat this calculation now with two molecules. And see what we see, because um, then, 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 yeah, I think I think that would address exactly the the question that you are asking or the point that you are making. Okay, thank you. But I think yeah. now, re going back to the original question I asked you, uh, I, I'm quite curious about those uh, dark state, dark state couplings because those are kind of not well understood. And, mm -hmm. uh, so, so. So I, I'm curious about the scalings. So if in the thermodynamic limit, uh, um, how, how do those, um, um, how, I mean, it's, it's kind of known through that because of disorder, uh, which I think in some sense, your, your vibronic coupling gives rise to some dynamical disorder. Uh, those dark states are delocalized across two or three molecules. And I wonder, how does that manifest in the scalings of the of the dark state dark state couplings that you're obtaining? Mm, I I don't know really. Um, I mean the the dark states. I mean I mean they, they're really delocalized across molecules, right? I mean if if yeah. you really take the 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 dark states that correspond to the purely atomic situation, so just forget about. Then, then really they are delocalized across everything, and then one can one can think um, how the uh, the participation of, of various molecules changes if one makes a small changes in the, for example, in the internuclear distances. But that's what we had in the in the in the first part. And then I guess you're right. And then then the, so as a function of the of the nuclear coordinates, the dark states contribution. So so how many molecules are contributed is probably changing quite a lot. In in, uh, in uh, with a small um, with a small displacement of the nuclear coordinates, right? Because the, it's changing the amount of, of photon, the amount of. Um, but well, I guess in the in the atomic limit, uh, there's a huge degeneracy that allows yeah. to have a, an ambiguity an ambigu right. on the basis. But then exactly. when you have the vibronic, when, when when you have the displacements that break symmetries and 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 gives rise to quote unquote disorder. And I, I guess I, it would be very interesting to see um, the, the localizations uh, under those, the localization lengths under those circumstances. And I was wondering in, in your case. Yes, I, I think, I mean, I, I, I can totally agree. I mean, I think you can see my pointer now with the mouse. I mean, in this situation, right? I mean, if you move out of the Franconian point in this, so the, the, the dark states or what we call the dark states, they will be uh, so their, their, the contribution of each molecule to each dark state will be changing quite a lot. But the, the question is, um, what do we really want to, I mean, or, or what effect would we attribute to this fact? I mean, we already see that there is a very fast um, um, dynamics that involves all these states, they all get mixed. Uh -huh. um, but what would, what would be the actual question that we ask to the system? So for example, a question that I would be wondering, and maybe you have the answer already is, okay, so suppose you have like these dark states, but you also have additional dark states in which you can do internal um, intersystem crossing or, or, or transfer to another S, S, S zero state or whatever. So under, under that case, is the dynamics through the dark state delayed by transferring through different molecules, like transferring the energy across different molecules before reaching like a target state? Or is it just like a boring, like do the dynamics of the dark states 
if I put one quanta of excitation in one of the dark states, does the energy behave as if it were localized in a single molecule or, 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 or is there additional channels of loss? I, I, I think that would be a... I don't know, because I think we, wish, we should even probably start really defining what we mean by dark states in the sense, are we talking about, about let's say, um, putting a, um, a classical point onto one of these potential energy surfaces and then seeing what happens? Or are we really talking about the, the complete quantum mechanical states of the whole system that are vibronic in nature and mm -hmm. that in, in a sense know nothing about conical intersections or anything like this, right? I mean... Okay, so, so, so maybe, maybe a more punctual question would be, for example, there are all these experiments that show that the photochemistry inside and outside of the cavity is exactly the same. So, so because, and, and presumably the argument is that uh, all the energy is being funneled through the dark states. And then, for example, I, I think it was an example of singlet fission by, the, by City College, New York. Uh, so, so, so in that case, uh, presumably because the dark states behave just exactly as, as bare molecules, the rate, of, the rate of singlet fission is exactly the same inside and outside of the cavity because everything is dominated by dark states. Yes. So then the question is, so then are there situations that go beyond that trivial conclusion? I don't know, but then, okay, so then I guess what one would like to see, so if the system is in this manifold of dark states, then one would like to understand something like, so what are the fluctuations that bring, that bring the system uh, out of these dark states into, uh, so let's say into, um, into populating the cavity mode? And, and back, right? I mean, the, the system is in these dark states, but these dark states have a little bit of, of photon component uh, uh -huh. as the molecules keep moving. And, uh, and this maybe can be even quantified and, and provide an average of the photon participation as a function of time. And I, I don't know, I mean, there, there could be something that one can then correlate with, uh, with the likelihood of some dynamics going on that has that, that needs the photon in the cavity or something like this, right? Or that needs the system in, in one of the polaritonic states. Mm -hmm. But I, I really don't know then, to be honest, I, I, I would have to think more about it. What, what actually, even what is that the actual question that we are trying yeah, to- Yeah, exactly. I think the question on itself is a little bit ill-defined, but then if one compares with something that could be experimentally measured, I think the question is well-established. So uh, I think that it will be interesting to look at the answer for those type of questions but um yeah, yeah. thank you yeah that, that, that was very very clear and very nice thank you okay. uh, just one last question from argadip why the argadip oh uh, hello can you can you hear me yes yes yeah so i i have a question about that uh effect where you had like a pumping to only the, like, uh, you had excitations only to the even modes and uh, ah, yeah. mm -hmm. towards the end. So I, I so is it like, um, so and, and, the, and the argument that you gave is like the cis, the, 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 the bending is like uh, isotropic about like, if you go to plus over my, I mean, it's symmetric, right? That, that's the, that's the argument. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a purely, it's, it's a symmetry argument. So, so if you take the cis geometry, which is planar, the torsion mode, if you do a harmonic approximation of the torsion mode, which is what mm -hmm. we have down here, mm -hmm. um, this distortion mode is a symmetric mode. So, mm -hmm. so any couplings with other modes that, that uh, move within the plane, so that mm -hmm. is the bond angle or the, or the bond stretches is going to be uh, a second order coupling. So it will change this potential, but not in, a, in an asymmetric way, but in a symmetric way. In an asymmetric way, it cannot be possible because it would mean that then the potential becomes different. So you modify a, a, a bond stretch mm -hmm. and then you, you go towards one side of the torsion and you see a potential energy and you go to the other side of the torsion and see another potential energy. This cannot be. I see, I see. So, so that's, that's the reason. So is it is it true for any any symmetric vibration, right? Uh, like the the totally symmetric mode. Uh, of... Yeah, yeah. You can you can see this. I mean, yeah. Different point groups, it will behave differently, right? What coordinates are coupled with what, and then you have to you have to analyze and, that. And, and and if we and and suppose we couple to the like uh, totally asymmetric mode, like the uh, the last of the irreducible prism. So the the totally and to the anti symmetric mode. 
Uh, will will I only pump the odd levels then? Uh. Uh, no. Well, I mean, in the case that you would have a mode that has no particular, let's say, a mode that that maintains the symmetry of the system. So imagine that you are looking at the coupling between uh, between the the NO double bond and one of the angles, right? All right. So that uh, that coupling is, uh, I mean, it, it will affect all possible combinations of quanta between the between mm -hmm. the different modes. So, but, but but is there any is there any way that we, I can pump on let's say only the odd modes like uh, like only odd number of transitions like one three five kind of that like in... Mm -hmm. not in not in this system I guess. I see. Okay. You can you can excite them. I mean, you can excite the, you can excite the old mode with a laser, right? I mean. No, no, I mean, I mean, in the in this phenomena, like, 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 we have we are having only even transitions, like with even quantas. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if I can have only odd quantas in some way, and that that was I was presuming with if if you, we you, couple to a total odd vibration, like, I mean, which no, which has you you you'll have only uh, uh, Fermi resonances involving the the even quanta with uh, with torsions, and then I guess also then the the odd quanta with odd quanta in a sense, right? But not even with odd because this is not coupled via the other vibrations of the system. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, let's thank Professor Renderl again uh, for the wonderful talk, and thanks everyone for for your attendance. Again, next week uh, we're gonna take a break and. Um, See you in two weeks. Thank you very much. Bye.